Praise the Lord. So good to have everybody in Bible study tonight. For those of you who are catching us online, thank you for being with us. We um, have several things that uh, we need to pray about tonight specifically, but then uh, I'm trying to think of any announcements. Christmas is coming. I, you don't need to be aware of that. I'm sure you already are. Um, I've got a few things. I want to pray for uh, Emily Murray, a special situation she's dealing with. Um, also, Sister Sally Peterson. Um, Sister Sally's been dealing with a lot of pain in her body for some time. She's been hospitalized, and we're just praying that the Lord would just help her and <laughs> give her some healing in her body, obviously, but also help her in making some decisions that she's going to have to need to make uh, here in the next, for the next, what her next move is going to be. Also, we want to remember Shannon Ar Arthur. Uh, some of you may know who she is, uh, dealing with uh, complications from COVID-19. We want to pray for the Cook family. Uh, Charles Cook is the pastor in Boonville, Missouri, and uh, he and his wife are dealing with covid and uh, we want the Lord to touch them as well. Does anybody have a special request you'd like to make mention here before we stand and pray? Sister Linda? Absolutely. Brother Scott. Yeah, Mary Milanowski needs some prayer. We want to pray for Sister Mary. All right, let's go ahead and stand. Let's bring these needs to the Lord tonight. Will you help me pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to come in for you, come before your throne of grace. God, we're asking for your help in these needs that have been mentioned here tonight. Lord, you know what Sister Emily needs. I pray, God, you would give her wisdom. Lord, give her insight, foresight. Lord, come to her tonight. Lord, give her, Lord, a direct path of where she needs to go and what she needs to do. I pray, Lord, for Sally and in her situation there in the hospital, Lord, that you administer to her body. I thank you for giving her, Lord, favor with the doctors. I thank you for giving her healing in her, in her physical body. But, Lord, encourage her spirit tonight. Lord, lift her up where she is. I thank you for taking care of Shannon, Lord, and, and the Cook family and all those that are dealing with uh, COVID-19, Lord, the the. the this request in Colorado. I thank you, Lord, for ministering to those situations tonight. Thank you to, for going to Mary Melanowski and, Lord, just uplifting her, Lord, in body and in spirit. Lord, let your name, Jesus, we pray, be glorified. We thank you for being a help in the time of need, and we trust you for it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. You may be seated. you are wanting a devotional for the new s series that we're getting ready to jump into, uh, please let Brother Scott know. He has those, and we can get those to you. Uh, we are jumping into a new series. This is our winter series, and so we're going to start. There's a three-part series that we're getting ready to start. Uh, series number one talks about the revelation of God. And then in our second series, so that's the month of December here. And then our second part of our series is in January, which is talking about standing on the promises of God. And then by the time we get to February, that's the third part, we're going to be talking about following Jesus. So it's going to be a good series here of lessons and just encourage you to get a, get a hold of them and digest them. If you want uh, some study material, please check into those devotions that Brother Scott has available for you tonight. All right, we're going to talk tonight about being commissioned by God. Commissioned by God. Um, being commissioned is really, a uh, better way to put it is just something that you've been called to do. Anybody here ever feel like you've been called to do something? Um, you know, we're called to do many things, obviously, throughout the day. I felt like I was right before church, oh, Lord, help me, I felt like I was called to 
explain to an eight-year-old how to load the dishwasher for the 6,000th time is like I was trying to describe to him how to do brain surgery or something. I'm like, Lord, I've been called to teach this kid. And uh, help me, help me, Lord. Um, but, you know, we're, we're all called to do things. And so we, I was looking at this lesson and just thinking about, you know, my commission and, and where God has took, taken me through my ministry and, you know, I what what I've been called to do. I mean, a, as a son of Doris Tallman, I was called <laughs> to do cleanup after every every church function because we were there. So we were we were there setting it up. We tore it down. We and so I, I learned early on ser- cleanup and servant servanthood and stuff like that. And it wasn't long before my sister left for Bible college and and I remember it was a Sunday night. She sat me down and said, All right, this is how you play the drums. One and two and three and four. You hit the bass drum on one and three, and you hit the snare drum on two and four. Good luck. And uh, I struggled, and oh, did I struggle. Because in my mind, I'm a creature of habit. Like, I'm the guy, if I get a Pepsi at Taco Bell, and there's a Pepsi here and there's a Pepsi here, I will go back to the same nozzle. Because I know what that nozzle tasted like and the mix of that nozzle. And like I'm just such a creature of habit. So when she tells me one and two and three and four, I'm playing everything, one and two and three and four, whether it's on one or two or three or four. But there's some songs where it's one, two, three, one, two, three, and there's some songs that just one, two, one, two, one, two. I didn't know any of that. And I, along with everyone else who is within earshot of my early year drumming suffered as I I finally deciphered the foot and hands of Sister Glenda McGarvey Stanley. And as she played that organ, I finally kind of put some things together, and I thank God for her and her patience. But as a drummer, I was expected to be here. Whether I was doing a good job or not, whether I was, it was just you're part of the music team, and we need drums, and here you go. This is what you're responsible to do. And so I was called to be a drummer. I was called to be faithful in that position. But it, but it, it kind of elevated from there. I, I was 12 years old whenever that happened. But then uh, by the time I was 16, I was teaching a Sunday school class. And you would think that, you know, all your life you've heard the stories. You've heard of David and Goliath and the three Hebrew boys and all the cliche stuff. Jonah and the whale, all these great stories we find in the word of God. And you would think that it would be easy just to regurgitate that and offer it to some kids, but it's not as easy as you think. Because whenever you get into a teaching position, you have to explain something. There's a little bit more to it than what you think. And so as being a Sunday school teacher, I was called to have competence Uh, And I was called to actually study my lesson and and know what it is I'm talking about. And so it wasn't long till after that, uh, while I was doing that, that I was called to be the janitor of the church. And so I would clean the church every Saturday, sometimes Friday, depending on what was going on in my life. And so we just I had those early years it was just vacuum 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 we had so much carpet in this church what was wrong with us we just all this blue carpet everywhere and and you'd have teachers that wouldn't put their chairs up on the tables for you even though you asked nicely you would come in there and there's like 12 chairs you got to mess with these little chairs all the time and vacuum underneath it's just stuff and so you you, you learn to just be have endurance. You're the janitor. You had to endure the, these things. You had to endure the vacuuming. And, but the cool thing was is eventually you find somebody named Jessie, and you pull her in, and you buy another vacuum. And you say, all right, babe, if you really do love me, you're going to help me. And she did. I was very thankful for that. Our early years, before even before we were even dating, we were just hanging out. We we're both bored, 
early years and just, hey, I, you know, I need some help. You want, you want back in the church? Sure. Okay. And this is where we landed. But, I mean, there, there was the endurance part of janitorial duties of the church. But then the Lord opened the door a little bit further, and he, he gave me an opportunity to be the bus driver. And so I would every Sunday wake up at a certain time because I knew if I wasn't at the church by wherever it was, 8, 30, 9 o'clock, you had to get here in order to run the route to pick up all the kids that you had to pick up. And so there's that steadfastness that you were called to just just be just to operate uh, as a bus driver. And you had to obviously you had to pick up a lot of noisy kids. I remember, I remember one time. Um, sister Vinny Dow was in the van and we had this old Chevy van and it was, it was, it was a van. I mean, God bless the Chevy. Uh, and, but the problem was, is that the, the passenger side door wouldn't always latch. Like it would act like it was shut. And some days you would try to shut it and it would just bounce and open back up. And then sometimes you thought it was latched when it wasn't latched. And, I remember on this one particular Sunday, we were running behind. We had to wait on the Hornbarger kids way too long than I probably should have. But then it ran us late, and I'm trying to get everybody picked up and get back to the church on time because, you know, service is going to start. And when service starts, I need to be on the drums so that all these things are going to go into, you know. And uh, I took a corner a little fast, and that door flew open, and Sister Vinny was on her way out. And I happened to reach over, and I caught her wrist as she was leaning hard, and uh, she was praying all the way. It was it was interesting, but you know, just being the bus driver that that was something that the Lord was so uh, so gracious to open up to me as a young man. But then uh, the Lord opened up an opportunity for me to become a board member where. I was called to be trustworthy and, and to to think through what it is that you know the future of this church is going to look like and and whatever it is that pastor was asking me to do I was I was going to do that and then the Lord opened up a door of opportunity for me then to become the assistant pastor and and many of you know my story you know how I got where I am today but it was it was something that the Lord was calling me to do it was a call to servitude it was a call to to do a little bit more than what I had done before. And then eventually the Lord called me to become the pastor, which I feel like the Lord has called me to a level of humility. God has called me to faithfulness, obviously. But also, more than anything, God has called me to surrender. Surrender to the leading of his spirit. Surrender to what it is that he wants to do, because we all know this is his church and we are his people. Amen? So... Being commi- that's my commission. I've just kind of shared with you my commission. God has commissioned me. Had I understood it, did I know what I was doing? Absolutely not. But as I surrendered and was faithful and committed uh, to what it is that God was calling me to do, God opened up the doorways. And, and we're here today. I'm here today. We're, we're all still surviving. The church is still alive today, and thank the Lord for it. And so tonight's lesson, we're going to be talking about commissions, and we're going to talk about three specific commissions, the commission of Moses, the commission of Joshua, and then the commission, obviously, that Jesus gives to us. Um, as we're starting here, Moses' great commission, this is, this is an interesting, obviously, we all mo- all, most all of us know the story that after Moses left Egypt, Moses lived the next 40 years with uh, relative honor and integrity uh, as a, a as he honed his skills in in the art of shepherding and he was he was in the in the back forty somewhere just tending sheep for literally forty years but um, he he saved he saved one of his kin kinfolk in Egypt and and we all know how this unfolds and he ends up taking the life of an Egyptian soldier and then he goes on the run and. He finds himself in a situation at a well where he rescues literally his future wife and um, ends up marrying her and becomes a son-in-law to a man named Jethro, a high priest of Midian. And so God put Moses in a place where he could be molded. God put Moses in a in a place where he could be sh- shaped and 
and sculpted and so he could eventually use him for his glory. And so God prepared Moses by putting him in a position where he had to surrender himself, literally surrender himself to the wilderness. He had to surrender. He had to step out into the unknown. In order for him to get into a position where God wanted to use him, he had to walk into what was not understood. He had to step into something. He didn't know where it was leading him. He didn't know how it was going to all work out. All he know, all he knew was that he had to go where he needed to go. And sometimes when God calls us, when God commissions us to do something beyond what we know, it feels like the wilderness. It feels like we're stepping into a realm of, of the unknown. And I think that's very important for us to think about because God does that. He does it on many different levels. You know, Israel had this long uh, stint of benefits of living in the land of Goshen in, in Egypt. And it was located on the uh, on the eastern side of the Nile Delta up, up toward the, the northern part of Egypt. And it was a prime land for farming. I mean, you can, I mean, can you imagine, like, just the fertile land? God literally just gave them the best of the best. Here it is. We're, we're growing stuff. We got, we got land that's well watered for ranching and growing cattle and everything else. They, they enjoyed those many years of privilege because of Joseph, obviously, and who had favor with Pharaoh. But God knew that one day Pharaoh would pass away and there would be a Pharaoh who knew not this Joseph character and he would enslave the entire land of Goshen and all the Israelites therein and and then for 430 years after the Israelites entered into Egypt eventually God would lead Moses to a place where he would grow under the auspices of Pharaoh himself and then lead them out of Egypt and so what appeared to be a Hebrew shepherd having a conversation as we get long in the story, we understand that he's, there's this Hebrew shepherd having a conversation with God in a burning bush form. And that is the turning point in the, in the storyline of Israel's history, this conversation with a bush. Now, it's crazy to think about. And, and I know some of the Bible stories that we, we read, it takes faith to believe some of this stuff. I mean, it takes faith to believe that God spoke to Moses out of a burning bush. But when you consider what, what, is a, what is now in the earth, what is now come to pass, Israel still survives to this day. The word of God, some of the things that Moses himself had pinned to parchment still survives today. That's a miracle. And that alone gives credence to the stories that were told by those people whose writings we still read today. And so th this, this burning bush experience is a turning point in Israel's history. And you can even take it a little step further. It's really a turning point in world history because what happened there obviously changes some of the world and most of the world as we know. In fact, there's no greater ideology or theology that has ever shaped the world of man than that of Christianity. By far, nothing else has sculpted human culture more than that of Christianity, good and bad, in a lot of different ways. Depends on what side of the tracks you're on. God, God spoke to Moses as he was shepherding his flock in Mount Sinai, and, and, and which also is known as Mount Horeb. And so God informs Moses and says, hey, uh, this is a significant occasion that that the ground in which you're standing, Moses, it's holy ground. And God begins to talk to him out of this burning bush. And, and he tells him, hey, take your sandals off your feet. This is holy ground. Holy ground. I'm, the, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he begins to tell him what he wants to do through him. Now, it would be nice if God, every time he commissioned somebody, he just began to speak to you in the way that he did Moses. But he doesn't do that for everybody. And it's probably good that he doesn't because even Moses himself was kind of taken back by this experience. And although Moses had received some of the best training that anybody had available to them in that day, imagine uh, the greatest power in the earth at that point is the nation of Egypt. Uh, they had all the knowledge. They had all the uh, technology. They had everything. And he had all that at his disposal. 
And so he enjoyed the best of, uh, uh, of all those things, but this, his leadership, his, his writing abilities, all those things he gained from the knowledge that he found in Egypt. But whenever he engages God in this burning bush experience, he, he asked the question, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring out the children of Egypt out of Egypt? And so when he's talking to God, he's, he's got this who am I complex, like I am nothing. God, I, I, I am not your guy. He starts to become that reluctant person. He doesn't want to do what God has called him to do. He, he's, he's giving God excuses. And with every one of Moses' excuses, God just refutes them one after another. God, I can't do it. God, I'm not your man. God, who am I that I should do this? I, I, I don't even talk right. I have a speech impediment, God. God's like, don't worry about that. I, I got Aaron already en route, and he's going to be your spokesman. He'll talk for you. Uh, he he did God God equipped Moses for what he was calling him to do and whether Moses felt overwhelmed whether Moses felt that he was unworthy or simply just compelled to be humble in the presence of God we cannot be sure but Moses made these objections to the Lord and the Lord responded to each one uh, each one of those who am I Moses would would use who am I God and Lord, the Lord would stay, state over and over that I am I'm the one don't worry about who you are just know that who I am that's where God says you know the I I am that I am who who am I going to say I mean he who am I was his conversation all the way through who am I going to say that sent me who who what who am I going to say it is that sent me to, again, it's who am I? Who am I going to tell them sent me? I am that I am. And all throughout this whole thing, God is just referring to Moses, re, telling Moses, hey, I am the one who's going to carry you through this. I am the one who's going to help you carry out your mission. I am the one who's going to be your strength. I'm going to be your provider. I'm going to be all these things. You just need to do what it is that I have called you to do. So, one of those, number one, was submit. And number two, be consistent with what I'm asking you to do, Moses. And when you think about if there's a question asked, the question is, is this, what do we do to, per to prepare ourselves for the calling that God puts on your life? How can you prepare for a calling? I mean, I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way, but Really, sometimes you have to ask yourself the weird questions, and that's one. How do I prepare to be called of God? How, what does that look like? What, 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 what do I need to do to be called of God and, and commissioned by God? Well, I'll tell you, there's two things you need to do. Number one, submit. Submit to God. Submit to what it is that he's put into your life in, in authorities. And, that, and authorities can be a many different, uh, that's a, that could be a wide range of people. Whoever it is that God's put over you, submit to them because God put them in your life for a reason. There's some part of you that has to be developed in order for you to be the person that you need to be for what God wants you to do. So number one, submit. But number two is to be consistent. Be consistent in what you're doing. Be consistent in who you are. When you're in church and you are who we see that you are, you need to be the same person whenever you're at home. You need to be the same person when you're at work. You need to be the same person. That way there's consistency and you are who you say that you are. You're not giving mixed messages. Have you ever seen God prepare someone for his service? Have you ever seen God prepare somebody to be used of him? I have many times. In fact, I, I, I've watched, I, I watched a, a, a young man uh, I asked, I asked this young man, I said, hey, I need you to go pick up so-and-so, and I just need you to help me with this because I, I'm not asking him to do anything I'm not willing to do. I just said, hey, I need you to go pick somebody up because I can't get to it. I, I've got too many other things going on here. Can you do this? And, and he started picking up this individual, individual and he got, he got that person to church on time, and he did it week after week after week service after service after service and he all he was doing was just doing what I asked him to do 
and he showed me that, number one, I could be trusted. Number two, I could be faithful and I could be committed to what it is that you've called me to do. And it wasn't something major. It wasn't something huge. It was just simple, a simple just going, picking somebody up for church. But he did it without fail. All the while, there's others who were highly talented, maybe favored, but they weren't as committed and submitted in areas. And so that consistent that consistency that we have in, in, in our love for the Lord, our love for the church, our compassion towards people that need our help, our faithfulness to the house of God, our faithfulness to the kingdom of God, all those things matter whenever it comes to God calling us and putting a commission on our life. I have a video I want to show you right now. Gabe, if you want to play that, uh, talking about um, consistency, and we, we definitely need consistency. There are three ways that you can show love to your neighbor. The first way you can do that is by caring for them. Find out a need that they have and care for your neighbor. If they need help with their yard being mowed, help them mow their lawn. If they need help with uh, a birthday gift that they're trying to build for their kid outside in the yard, help them build that. You can show that you love your neighbor by caring for them. Another way you can do it is by being compassionate. If you see that they have a need in regards to a pain that they're going through, show compassion to them. Show them that you care and are compassionate. But the most important thing you can do is by consistently showing the love of Jesus by the way that you live. If you can be caring and compassion in a consistent way, you will show love to your neighbors. And getting into that, showing your showing love to other people and showing um that you care for other people is one of the greatest ways of reaching somebody. Anybody know that to be true? That is true. That you can reach into people's lives just by simply looking at them and their need and whatever it is that they need. And so consistency being a part of that, that they know you are who you say you are, that if I need help, I know who I can call on. I know who, who it is that I can trust. And so Moses had this great mission that the Lord was willing to help him through and and brought him through a wilderness situation, and obviously the children of Israel along with that. What a commission that was. I mean, to think about it, he, he probably would much rather be herding sheep than people. But ironically, Jesus would allude to the two of them as being similar in temperament and, and in wit. But it's... It's just this idea that, you know, he, he was called to do so much more and God commissioned him to do that. But not did, not only did God commission him, but God also equipped him. And that's the thing I I feel like the biggest takeaway is this, is that if God calls you, God will equip you. You may not feel like you're equipped, but God will give you what you need. Moses was charged to take that mission to one level, but then he was charged to also hand that mission over to a young man named Joshua, and, and that, uh, that was to take the people all the way to that promised land. But that would shortly become uh, a really a big challenge for Joshua. And so it was a, a really an important moment both in, the, both in Israel's focus and, and, and its purpose. Whenever you think about it, Israel's purpose and Israel's focus, its leadership, all changed with one person. Uh, when when that happened, when Joshua took the reins of Israel, God God absolutely changed the leadership, but He also changed their focus. We're not just focused in getting through the wilderness now; we're focused on in, infiltrating and impacting the promised land. We're going to go into this place that we've been talking about all this time. And so, what had gotten them to that point in the wilderness was not going to be successful necessarily in the next stage of their evolution. And so it's important for us to understand that even about the church today, there are some aspects about the the early history of the church and some of those old-fashioned ways that we grew up on and some of the things that we cut our teeth with. Those were necessary to get us through wildernesses and through, uh, through mountain ranges and through all those areas of that travel and traversing through that history time. But even now, 
sometimes there's a change of leadership to take us into a new season and to a new place. And what, ha what worked before doesn't necessarily always work in the next stage of, of a church's journey. And so it's important to know that. And so they, they required a change of focus, and they also required a change of leadership. And that, that change came in the form of Joshua. Now, the Lord spoke to Joshua and engaged a, a covenant with him much like he did that with Moses. You find the same exact verbiage that God used with Moses. He uses it also with Joshua. Joshua, I'm going to give you some battle plans. But before I do, the place where you are standing is holy ground. Take off your sandals. Same thing, same situation. He does it with Joshua. And the end of Joshua 5 records that. That, that the Lord is telling Joshua, take, take, take your shoes off and, and be assured that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of you. And I've got a divine strategy to conquer your first city, which is going to be Jericho. And so there's this commissioning that's happening in Joshua's life. And so the Lord equipped Joshua for the leadership. Uh, really, he equipped him at an earlier age. We, it's not just whenever they get to... Um, Jericho that God's going to start putting into his life what it is that he needs to win the battle. This started many years prior whenever he was just the right, even when he was a young man, a spy going to spy out the land of Canaan God was working on the commission process in Joshua's life. He was submitted. It was him and Caleb that were the ones that brought the good report back to the to, to the people, and we have the 12 spies, but the 10 were, had the bad report, and they're, oh, man, we're like grasshoppers in their sight, and they're going to kick our rears, and, uh, and they're like, oh, we can do it, we can do it now, let's go. And, you know, they brought, I, and I'm thinking in my mind, it says that there was grapes, clusters of grapes that they brought back as evidence, and it had to be held on the shoulders of two men. Like, literally, you could think of a staff on one guy's shoulder and another guy behind him. There's this huge cluster of grapes, and they're carrying this evidence back over the Jordan River to the camp to show them that this is what's on the other side. I imagine in my mind, the Bible doesn't say it, but I'm imagining that was Joshua and Caleb. They were the two guys because... If, you are, if you're going to give the report you're going to give and you're part of that 10, I'm pretty sure you're not bringing grapes back with you. But these guys brought back that evidence. It's just like, here it is. It's on the other side. And I've always thought, man, what did they do with the grapes? They ate them. And you know what they did? They ate them and they went to bed and they started having nightmares about what it was that was waiting on them on the other side. Instead of dreaming, they were fearful because of the report from the ten spies. No wonder God got mad. He said, as far as I'm concerned, he's like, if you're going to believe that, when you should have been dreaming about the magnificence of what it is that I have brought you to, now none of y'all going to get it. I mean, that was such a dad thing to do. You know, it's like, it's like, y'all going to complain about this? Well, I'm going to, none of y'all going to get it. I mean, it's just, it was such a thing to do. But I, we have Joshua, he was part of that. And, and he was there beside Moses in the tabernacle whenever the Lord was going face to face with Moses. And, and the Bible even says in Exodus 33 that Joshua lingered as Moses left the tabernacle and went back into the camp. There was Joshua. Staying behind in the presence of God, just I and I'm I'm imagining he's a young man and he's just bewildered by what it is that God was doing to or through Moses in that time. But could it have been that God was also speaking to Joshua? And so Joshua learned to depend on the Lord for victory as he watched that happen in Moses' life. Even when Aaron and Hur were holding up the hands of Mo Moses in the air and Joshua and the army of Israel were conquering the Amalekites and they would get the victory. He was learning that it's dependence upon God that gets us the victory. He was stepping further into a deeper level of commission from God whenever he would surrender to the, what the Lord was wanting to do. And so that was very important because God was equipping Joshua from a young age to become the leader that he needed him to be in an older age. So 
here's the thing. God has commissioned us all to enter into the promised land. What does that mean? It means this. Every one of us has been uh, commissioned to enter into the promised land. As the nation of Israel left Egypt and they, they rejected Egypt and they embraced the unknown of what God had it for them, that's what we do in repentance. Whenever we let go of our old ways and we adopt something that maybe we don't understand everything about it, but we go back to what it is that, that, that you know, here, here it is. This is repentance. It's entering into something that uh, we don't quite understand, but we know that there's a possibility with it. And so that's what repentance is really all about. It's the turning away of sin from your old lifestyle. And just as the nation of Israel crossed through the Red Sea, you know what that represents. That's baptism. And so we are in, invited to receive the name of Jesus Christ in baptism for the remission of our sins. And, of course, you know, this all goes back to Acts 2.38. And, and just as they crossed over the Jordan into the promised land, we too are called to inherit the promise of God. What is the promise of God? And it's the Holy Ghost. The promise is the, that's, that's what was promised to us. And so the, the lifestyle of Holy Ghost I empowerment in a believer's life is typified, it, it's it, it illustrated by that of the promised land whenever you're reading the story of the Exodus. And so we enter into our promised land by obeying the gospel of Acts 2.38. And so we, and we all know what that is. That's repentance, water baptism in Jesus name and the promise of the receiving of the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so that's where we have been commissioned. It's whenever we receive the commission of that Acts 238 message. It's a commission to be more, to go further and to to reach further than what it is that we normally would have been able to do. And that's all through the power of the Holy Ghost. And so the Great Commission of Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ comes to us through the work of salvation. But let's talk about what Jesus is commissioned. And we all know what the Great Commission is. It's where Jesus talks to his disciples and says, hey, guys, go into all the world, teach and preach and, and make disciples of all nations. And so let's give some context to this. Jesus has been brutally crucified. He has been nailed to a cross. He's been taken down. He's been buried. But he rose again, and then after his resurrection, but prior to his ascension. So he's resurrected, but he has not ascended yet. He spends some time with his disciples. And so Jesus, in this, in this period of time, begins the commissioning process. Did it begin then? No. It really started early on, but they didn't really understand everything that had happened. And so Jesus is coming back to put all the puzzle pieces in place for them. And so he begins this commissioning of his disciples to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And so the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record the essence of Jesus' message, but they all emphasize, di they emphasize different details. And so, like, when you look at Matthew, Matthew emphasized uh, baptism, and he listed the manifestations of the Godhead, and he's talking, and he, it's consistent with Matthew's uh, address to the Jewish audience that he was trying to reach and, and, and teach that Jesus is the fulfillment of all three manifestations, which is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When you talk about Jesus, you're talking about all three of those. He was the revealed image of the invisible God. And then we have Mark, who, who Mark's, Mark's emphasis emphasized really baptism as a part of salvation, but he also emphasizes Jesus' name as a point of authority. And so whenever we're buried in baptism in Jesus' name, it gives us an authority. And so it's it's an authority for, for salvation, but it's also an authority unto us for uh, miracles, signs, and wonders, and all those kinds of things. So this is, uh, it's something with Mark, whenever he's addressing uh, the Gentile converts, uh, because they needed teaching on the importance of baptism. And so then you jump into Luke, and I love Luke because he's a good writer. He's a smart guy. And Luke's account emphasizes really repentance and the remission of sins in Jesus' name. Uh, remission of sins would have really been uh, conveyed in baptism after repentance. And so Jesus is is working through these guys, and, and, and they're, they're going to take it to the next level. But Jesus did did two things. He, number one, he spoke to his disciples, and then after he spoke to them, he equipped them. 
it's important for you to know what the expectations are of you before someone gives you a job. Wouldn't you say that's fair? I mean, there's nothing more frustrating than saying, you know what, you should have been doing this. Well, no one ever told me to do that. But when someone lays out what it is that you're supposed to be doing and then empowers you to do it, they probably expect you to do it because you, you don't have an excuse now. Jesus spoke to his disciples for literally 40 days after his resurrection, and, and he's, he's elaborating how it is essential for him to be crucified, that what you saw happen to me, that was part of the process. What, what, what you saw that they did to me, they buried me, and then now I have raised myself from the grave. He, he's, he's telling them how essential that was and how important it was, and he's putting these puzzle pieces together for them. He also instructs them to wait for the fulfillment of that great commission that would eventually come on the day of Pentecost. And so that was in the form of the Holy Ghost. And, and Jesus gave special attention to Peter, assuring that he understood the mandate to go and feed God's flock. He, he, was, he was doing all these things, and he was commissioning them to step out into something that maybe they've never done before, but God would equip them with what they needed. Because you notice, as they went, as they started to do the ministry in the early church, they were just being led by the Holy Ghost. What they would say before kings and magistrates, what they would do in response to beatings and, and, and imprisonment, and all these things were happening. It was all through the equipping of the power of the Holy Ghost. And so Jesus was equipping his disciples over the course of his ministry, yes, but then he really gave them the big guns, so to speak, whenever he filled, whenever he empowered them through the power of the Holy Ghost. And so when he sent them out to minister, they understood that the power of his name and, and they understood the divine provision that he would give to them. He, they, they began to understand these things. And whenever he walked on water, they, they understood that his power that he had over nature. And when he washed their feet, at the Last Supper, they understood the, uh, the power of humility. And when he rose again from the, from the dead, they understood, the, they finally grasped the essence of his death, burial, and resurrection. And he's, what he's doing is he's, he's slowly leading them to a commission where I, I don't think they quite understood everything that they were getting ready to be called to do, but he wasn't going to let them off the hook. That's why... I know Jesus came back for Thomas. <laughs> Give Thomas a bad rap. Thomas, you doubter. Well, Thomas was just like, look, guys, I don't understand. Y'all saying y'all seen him. I don't think I haven't seen nothing. Until I see it, I ain't going to believe. And Jesus steps back through the wall and says, look, Thomas, I ain't going to let you do that. I've got too much invested in you. I've put too much in. And so you, you don't get the opportunity to not believe. Here it is. What do you need? What evidence do you need? What kind of gruesome, gory, whatever you got to do? You want to put your finger in that? Then go ahead because I need you to fulfill the commission that I've called you to do. And so he did all those things. And then after receiving the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, they became, uh, they came into the fullness of understanding that prepared them to establish the church that we know is still growing today. What a miracle that is. So what we were called to do is we are called now to fulfill that great commission. And no matter what your gift is, we all can do some of the basics. Now, is everybody called to preach? No. Is everybody called to teach? No. Uh, everybody's got different giftings. That's what the body of Christ is all about. And so there are four things I'm going to give to you right here before we move to close. Number one, live a sanctified life that glorifies God. We can all do that. Is, is that, I mean, that's your reasonable service? Just, just live a, a good life. Live, live a life that's clean, that's holy, that's modest, that glorifies and reflects God's, God's nature in you. That's number one. Number two, be ready to give an account for your faith. Point people to God. Point people to the cross. Point people to the Acts 2.38 message. Point people to Christ in whatever way that you can. Be ready to give an account for your faith. That means be equipped with a testimony to tell somebody what it is that God's done for you. 
That's number two. Number three, display loving kindness and thoughtfulness in all that we do. Be someone that someone else can rely on in a crisis, in a catastrophe, in whatever it is that's happening. Be someone that has kindness and love connected to them, thoughtfulness. Number four, find our gifts and callings and pursue them with excellence. Find your gift and calling and pursue them with excellence. We can do some things collectively, but there's some things that we can only do individually. And to put the gospel message in its fulfillment in front of people and their, in front of their hearts and minds, you, you've got to be aware of what it is that God's trying to do in your life. And we look at Moses. He started strong, having received some of the best training for most of his life in, in that in Egypt, but it was not a guarantee of success until he surrendered and submitted to what God was wanting him to do. And I, I would even say today that there are great men and women who could be used of God in great ways, but they're not willing to submit to what God wants for their life. You know, having to run for your life like Moses did, I mean, that's, that's not fun, but it puts you in position for where God wants you to be so he could put you into that next step. Moses engaged God, and God used him mightily. The Lord granted him another 40 years of life and, the, and that world-changing ministry that he took all those people through the wilderness. It's just an amazing idea to even think about. The truth is we all struggle with whether or not we can make a difference or if God will ever open doors for us to be used of him, to be used by him. The truth is God will and God does. He does it. He's always reaching for an opportunity. He's always trying to put an opportunity in front of us. When we remain faithful to the Lord and make daily contributions with our time, our talent, our treasures, our resources, whatever it is that we have, the Lord takes note of those things. The little things that you can say yes to, the more things God's going to put on your plate. If I could trust you with this, then maybe I could trust you with this. And he slowly, it's a buildup of, of faithful submission to what God's trying to do in your life that leads you to those big things. I, I used to go to these conferences or, or go to these conventions as a young person and hear these testimonies, these people doing just crazy stuff. And you're just like, man, I want that. But then it, it was always this reality check of you don't know what they had to go through to get to where they are. And you know how many little things had to add up to where they were in their, in their faith walk and the, the anointing that they possessed? It took a lot of stuff. And really, that's what God's calling us to do. Just say yes to the thing. Yeah, say yes to what's in front of you right now, at whatever level that, that, that may be. Has God given you a mind for business? You know, can you, can you close a sale better than you can close your back door? I mean, what, what it, I mean everybody's got giftings. Everybody's got something that you're good at, you know. You're you're good with money. You're if you're a if you're a, a if you're a good hostess. I mean, Lord have mercy. We need more of that. Just you you have a way of making people feel welcome. You have a way about you, a demeanor about you that just engages people, and you're friendly, and you can connect with people. Maybe you have uh, you're, you're you're a sanguine, and you can connect with people, and all of a sudden people love you for no reason. They don't even understand why they love you. They just love you. And you have a way of drawing people close. You, you have a gifting about you. There's so many gifts in the church. And, and there's so many different ways that people are. But God can use each and every one of them. This last, was it yesterday, Pearl Harbor? Yeah, it was yesterday. I was, I was looking at some stuff and it was talking about the USS Missouri. And it was on the deck of the U USS Missouri that the, uh, the armistice to cease with uh, Japan was signed on September of 1945. And just like, that's pretty cool, you know, the USS Missouri. It was built and it was, it was plugged into the Pacific uh, realm 
back at basically the tail end of the war, but it was a very important ship, and it did that, and and then eventually was decommissioned in 1992, and it's it's there in Honolulu. You can tour it now, along with you know the USS Arizona, which obviously is underwater, and it was just really cool. You know some of the things that you could do, and I was just thinking about that, and I thought, you know what, that amazing ship that was commissioned by the U.S. government to go and be what it was supposed to be, and it was what it was supposed to be. It helped win the war, and eventually the war was quelled with the signature of Japan's surrender on its very own deck. That's pretty cool. But here's the thing. When it comes to a child of God, you have been commissioned, and you will never be decommissioned. You will never be decommissioned from what it is that God has called you to do. Let's stand together. God has commissioned us. And we're not going to be decommissioned anytime soon. So that means if we're going to do what it is that God want, God's willed for us to do, God's purpose in our life is for us to reach somebody. Let's pray right now and let's ask the Lord to just, as he is equipping us to say yes to what it is that's in front of us, maybe to open up a door for something bigger. I want you to just say yes to that. I want you to just, just kind of tell the Lord right now if you can, just Say, Lord, whatever it is that you're putting in front of me, Lord, that I, 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 I'm seeing it, but, Lord, I'm not quite surrendering to it. I want you, Lord, to deal with me about those things. Lord, whatever it is, Jesus, can you tell him right now, Lord, whatever it is, Lord, that you're calling me to, Lord, help me to have the faith, Lord, help me to have the boldness, help me to have the su sensitivity to surrender to what it is that you're commissioning me for. Lord, we have been commissioned to go and make disciples. And, Lord, that's what we want to do. That's what we need to do. That's what we're supposed to do. Lord, we have not been decommissioned from that calling. Lord, help us in whatever areas that we have time, we have whatever areas that we are talented in, whatever it is that you, we have to offer. Help us, Lord, to use our giftings, Lord, that we can fulfill the calling and the commission that you've commissioned us for. Help us to be bold in our commission and help us, Lord, to be, uh, help us to understand our commission, Lord, and help us to be focused on it, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being in Bible study. We look forward to seeing you guys on Sunday. Don't come alone. Invite somebody to come with you. God bless you. We'll see you then.